Welcome to this edition of The Breakdown. I'm Kalani and you are a patron of World Drum Club. So this is a tune that was a pop tune. It is a pop tune in China. And in selecting instruments for this tune, the first thing I wanted to consider was what's already there, right? What am I working with? Uh, what's recorded? And then how can I enhance that? And as a percussionist, one of my main concerns is I want to bring out the music. I want to make the music more effective. But in general, uh, I don't want to distract, first of all. I don't want to bury anything. Uh, and I don't want really want people to notice most of what I'm doing. It's kind of like the good music for a movie, right? You shouldn't really notice the music. It should affect you. It should be part of the experience, for sure. But it should enhance it shouldn't draw a lot of attention to uh, itself or it shouldn't bury anything for sure. So let's talk about how to approach a piece of music that it's already recorded. Uh, in this case, we basically have drums, bass, guitar, maybe some keyboards, and of course vocals. So I've got a few staple instruments here. Of course, wind chimes, which actually this is called a mark tree. Um, it was invented by Mark Stevens, an LA studio mu uh, musician. This is, people call this a wind chime, but that's just a short, a short version of that explanation. <laughs> Mark tree is actually in a row. Wind chimes are like the things you hang on your porch. Um, but I've got this uh, Mark tree and it's a double row ohm chime. It sounds like this. And notice this doesn't have a damper bar, so it's a little risky in a studio setting, but these chimes, they tend to kind of move this way and, and not continue to clack together, crash together. And I don't mind a little bit of extra um, because, or extra ring, because when I'm editing, we can just taper that down and fade it out, and it's not a problem. Um, I like this one because it's high pitched. It doesn't have a, a big, um, pitch center though. It doesn't sound like a tonal, you know, like a pitched instrument. It's just got that shimmer. So these are, this is a solid, solid bar chime and it's double row and it's got sets of six that are the same pitch. So all these are the same basically. And then the next six are the same. So actually it is going down a scale. It's going down a diatonic scale, but it doesn't sound like that when you play it. So wind chime for this piece, light, delicate, etc. Speaking of light and delicate, I've also got some uh, bells that are called ankle bells, belly dancer bells. You can find these, um, you know, belly dance supply place. I really like these for adding a little bit of shimmer over the top. Again, they don't interfere with any other harmonics that are happening, any, any harmony instruments. So that's a couple, a couple sets of ankle bells. Also in the light and delicate category, I've got a J call. This is an Acme J call. It's a wind whistle. There are other types of wind whistles that you can get. It's basically just a little flying saucer thing. And I've covered this in the whistle video, whistle sounds videos, but essentially this is just white noise or wind noise and you can, you can play it like this. I play it like this with a inside my hand. Um, I can blow in this end and then I can change the, the timbre by opening and closing my hand. So I can use this in place of or to complement a suspended cymbal roll. Speaking of which, I've got some mallets here. These are actually Piatti mallets, or sus I'm not, I'm sorry, suspended cymbal mallets. Piatti are the cymbals you crash together. College music terms. Okay, so what I do in this recording instance, a lot of the time um, is play two mallets in one hand, like this, like I'm gripping marimba mallets, and I'll do a roll like this. Now, even though that's not the best roll, you could get a better roll this way. Uh, it's okay for the recording because there's other stuff happening. Um, and I, when I did the recording, I did it as if I was doing more of a live performance. 
if I was only studio, you know, and I had a lot of time to record multiple takes, I would have just focused on one pass of just suspended cymbal. Uh, the important thing here is I've got a small cymbal that actually has a pretty big sound. It's lower pitched for the size. This is a 14 inch, uh, it's called a fast crash. It's Peisty. I want to point out this situation, which is my way of reducing the vibrations and noise that can happen. So I'm not using a traditional washer wing nut up here because I don't want anything vibrating and rattling. So what I did is I'm using electrical wiring here. I created my own little washer situation under here. And, and so the reason I did that and I'm not putting it on the stand is I don't want the vibrations from the cymbal transferring down here because I've got everything connected here. So this acts as a little bit of an insulation and it helps isolate the cymbal vibration uh, so it's not affecting the other stuff, right? That's my rationale for that. Also, I've got some um, little chime cymbals here. Um, I guess you could call it, these would be called ohm cymbals or finger cymbals or um, different kinds of chimes. If you do use these, um, yeah, you want to make sure they're not going to hit anything. And then you can play them with a triangle beater like this. This is a nice triangle beater. I've got a whole bunch of different size triangle beaters. But you can um, probably just play one of them. And I'm using the other one to sort of anchor the lower one. I don't know if you guys can see that. Okay, but it's, it's hanging one below the other like that. Right. And so I would use a triangle beater just to strike the lower one. Yeah, the upper one's kind of muted. But that's a nice sound. And that brings us to triangle. So in the recording, I'm mounting the triangle on a stand because just to make it easy to access and I'm changing instruments a lot. So I need to have it mounted. Ideally, I would hold it like this and I would just focus on playing triangle Now, if you get a nice triangle, and this is an able triangle, I think this is a, is that a six inch, five or six inch um, orchestral style triangle, spend some money, buy a nice triangle. There's lots of different triangles out there. There's some great ones that are affordable, but you know, you get what you pay for. This is a really nice triangle. What makes a nice triangle? Well, it's got a really kind of pure tone. It's got a brilliance to it, so it's got a lot of harmonics. It doesn't have a clunkiness to it, so it's got a lot of highs that are complex, and that's gonna be helpful because it'll blend with lots of different styles of music, and again, you won't have a tonal, you don't really want a pitch, you don't want a tone that could clash with other instruments. Um, also, when you play the triangle, experiment with where you strike it, because if I, if I strike it down here, it sounds different than if I strike it here. Right? It sounds different to me. I don't know if you guys can hear that in the mic, but experiment with the triangle. You can clip it. Like I said, this is just a, a little clip that you could buy in the hardware store. And then I've got a little zip tie right here, a piece of zip tie, um, or you can do some leather or something. And then it just clips on there. And then I'm playing it over here. Invest in a nice triangle beater or two also. These are Grover. I've got some other ones that are able triangle beaters. Investigate, get a nice triangle beater. Bigger triangles, usually use bigger triangle beaters, smaller, smaller. So it's, um, it's kind of like mallets, right? You can use bigger and smaller mallets, harder and softer mallets, depending on what you're playing. Uh, if you're wondering about these, I use these a little bit. These are some ankle, ankle pods, we call them, or ankle rattles. These, this would again be used in um, like African style dancing. This is a set of maybe three or four of them. And I tie them together. And it has a nice a high end kind of sound quality to it. Um, I would use these similar, similarly to uh, a shaker roll like that, or maybe using the kashishi, maybe wind chimes. It's in the same general category. So it just adds some texture and interest. Again, something that can add a little spice without hopefully being uh, detracting or distracting. Really quick, I did touch on the shaker. I'm using this style shaker in this piece because it's a lighter piece. It's a lighter shaker. 
This is, uh, how many is that? Seven egg shakers glued together. I may also go to this shaker, which is a shaka shaker. A little beefier, a little more percussive, a little more staccato. Uh, depends on the on the song and what's required. Um, I I'm using one kashishi. In this particular arrangement, I'm using this more as a sound effect. Uh, you could certainly, you know, use it more as a shaker, as a rhythmic thing. But I like the kashishi as a sound effect. And you notice I'll often use that and play out of time um, like a triplet or hemiola almost or something that's faster and slows down and that just br can break up a rhythm um, and add some interest, add some rhythmic texture, if you will, to a piece. I've also got one of these, which is, uh, I don't use it a lot, but every once in a while, this has been called different things. LP calls it the cricket. I think um, there's different brands. Some brand call it the night or whatever, but Sounds like that. It's a metal tube. There's metal ball bearings in here and they strike the tube. That's just a little sound effect. Similar to this, I don't know if these actually have a name. I just call it the baby rattle. Um, it's quite loud, so I'll, I'll tend to play this away from the mic. It's pretty loud. Uh, and then in mixing, you know, we, we can manage the, the level exactly. But um, that brings me to another point, which is you want to be aware of where your microphone is. Now, I have the mic about here. I know it's just out of the frame, but uh, about two feet or three feet above my general area. And for percussion, you don't want to mic things too close because you can get a lot of transients and, and kind of harshness, especially with the metal sounds. So a little farther away is fine. Um, I'm using a Rode microphone. It's a large diaphragm tube mic and it picks up all this stuff really well, so I don't have to get it really close. Uh, the other instruments I have are tambourine, and in this case I'm just using, mostly doing tapping, mirroring, mirroring or marrying this with a snare drum sound. In some cases I'm doing a rhythm, and I'm always very aware of how close to the mic I am, because my goal in this recording is to as much as possible, balance a lot of the sounds um, when it's being recorded, so I don't have to do that later. And also, so I get a clean signal. So getting some of the softer instruments closer to the mic, playing some of the louder instruments farther away from the mic, so that you know it on when it goes into the computer in the recording, it's not really loud and really soft, but it's got more of a balance. Uh, I'm also using kabasa. This is a giant kabasa. I'm using that as a rhythmic tool. Uh, and I'm using sleigh bells, some nice, nice sleigh bells. One of my favorite sound effects, not used that often, uh, but really, I think really effective. Again, in the wind chime uh, category, really, in terms of a sound effect, metal, it's a metallic sound, but it also can be very high. You can EQ it so it doesn't have a lot of lows. Maybe in a future video, I'll show you guys exactly what I do when I mix these instruments because there's some EQing and different ways you can um, treat these instruments to get the best out of them and not get anything you don't want in the recording. Because believe it or not, some of the sounds like cymbals, even with uh, wind chimes and uh, sleigh bells, you can actually have some lower frequencies in there uh, that sneak into the recording that you might not want. All right, so we'll talk about that too. So um, in general, the song form, you know, I'm looking at verse, uh, introduction, actually intro, what am I doing in the introduction? Usually that's more sound effects, introducing some of the sounds, just enhancing the intro. And then in the verse, probably just a shaker maybe the triangle, just playing time, trying to enhance what's already there. There's already drum set, so I want to enhance what the drummer's doing. And then I'm really looking at transitions, right? Going into a chorus, suspended cymbal or wind chimes, a lot of the time in that in or out of a section. Also the J call, you can think about that. And then we've got verse, chorus, verse, chorus in you know typical arrangement. A lot of these are standard pop arrangements, so it's verse, verse, chorus. Verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, outro. 
And uh, I try to be consistent. I'll listen to the tune three or four times. I'll do a couple practice passes and then I just go for it. And then if I have to, I fix something in editing. Um, hopefully I don't have to do much in editing. Um, yeah, so these are the sounds I was using. Again, mic placement. This is just one mic recording. You could do two. If you do two mics, um, then you wanna be aware of you know where your left and right placement is. I tend to prefer one mic, especially with a lot of these sounds, because if you put two mics, if you put them farther apart, you can end up with what we call um, a lazing or a, a kind of chorusing effect because the sound source is reaching, the sound is reaching each mic at slightly different times and you can end up with some mixing issues. So I prefer just one mic, but I would, if I was recording this for just for uh, an album, I would probably focus on each instrument individually, get it just that, and then we'd mix everything together later. Um, in this recording, I was also doing uh, bongos, which, you know, is pretty straight ahead. Uh, but this is all the hand percussion parts. So uh, I hope that that uh, is good information for you. If you have any questions about any of these instruments, I know you probably want to know where you can get some of these things. Um, what I could tell you is just search online. Your guess is as good as mine. I've collected a lot of these things over many, many, many years. And I don't really know where you can buy them today. But um, send me a message if you want. I'll try to point you in, a, in the right direction. But you know, in, the, in today's world of internet accessibility and searchability, I think you can probably try to look at these things yourself and do just as good a job. Okay, so again, this has been The Breakdown. Thanks for being a World Drum Club patron, and uh, we'll do it again next month. Thanks for watching.